So, most people think to do big things, you need big tools. I want to show you how we can do big things using small tools. Imagine you want to study a creature with extreme abilities, or you want to study global warming. What if you want to study the process of bone decalcification? And perhaps you don't have enough budget for that, uh, like us. So we found the answer, space. In the past, doing science in space was in the domain of big corporations and governments. These were big satellites made by deep pockets. Make, make, like making these satellites required big tools and even bigger budgets. Since the space race in the 50s, more than 6,600 satellites have been launched in space, ranging from the International Space Station all the way down to nanosatellites. In fact, nanosatellites were used uh, as replacement for dummy weight blocks that initially were used to balance uh, rockets n uh, with non-mass symmetric satellites upon launch. On the other hand, launching a satellite requires definitely a budget, and the budget is proportional to the size and the mass of the satellite. So, a smaller satellite means cheaper to launch. But, can you still do the science with it? Well, this is where our student organization, OMSAT, comes in. Our student organization, which stands for, OMSAT stands for University of Manitoba Space Application and Technology Society, is run entirely by volunteer students. Students are trying to do the biggest challenges in their life to tackle one, like some of the biggest problems in science. So let's go to the experiments that we have on our satellite. The first experiment is about the toughest animal on the planet. This animal can withstand liquid helium which is minus 272 degrees, almost one Kelvin, all the way up to 150 degrees boiling, more than boiling, <laughs> and uh, immense pressure, you name it, uh, radiation and all these things. Is this some kind of science fiction monster to scare children and eat whole cities? Does such animal even exist? Well, the answer is yes, this animal exists, and the good news is, it's not a monster. In fact, it's very awesome, and it's called the tardigrade, or moss piglet, or more endearingly, the water bear. Water bears can be found almost everywhere, from frozen reaches of Antarctica, all the way to searing edges of active volcanoes. And, no surprise, despite our harsh and unfavorable winter, in, uh, you can find them even here in Winnipeg. And as you may know, that last winter, Winnipeg was colder than the surface of the moon, of the Mars. So, if tardigrades can make it here in Winnipeg, then Mars shouldn't be that big of a deal, right? So, it turned out that if you desiccate tardigrades, they turn to some deep uh, hibernation, which is called the cryptobiotic state. And if you pour water on them, they turn out from this cryptobiotic state. This cryptobiotic state is where they become so supernatural and they can withstand all this uh, like, uh, immense uh, radiation and like, all these things. So we thought that, OK, what will happen if we put tardigrades in their cryptobiotic state in something very harsh, like the vacuum of space? It turned out that. Back in 2008, the European Space Agency, or ESA, sought to test this extreme ability of tardigrades, and they put tardigrades in their cryptobiotic, st like in their cryptobiotic state, took them to space, exposed them to the vacuum of space, brought them back to Earth, rehydrated them, and guess what happened? Surprise, surprise, they turned alive, and they act like nothing really happened, they were looking for food. So, you may say, like, these guys are really strong survivors. And then, you may also think, like, why are we trying so hard with these creatures? Well, this is where the, like, the cool ideas 
pop out. It has been shown that tardigrades can stay without food, without oxygen, without water for 10 years if you put them in cryptobiotic state. So another question is, how long would it take to travel from one planet to another planet? So, you know that the Earth is floating in a crowd space, uh, which, like, we have a lot of comets, asteroids, and meteorites, and in fact, Every day, 44 tons of meteoritic material falls on Earth. And luckily, most of them, they vaporize upon entering the atmosphere because they are small. And once in a while, a big one comes in, and you hear in the news something happened, like the last one happened like, uh, in Russia. And uh, apparently, some big ones that rendered dinosaurs' life to extinction. Hopefully, nothing like that happens soon. So, it has been shown that in a big impact, debris from a planet can escape back to the space and they can go all the way to other planets. And with having this in mind and having the tardigrades with these extreme abilities, you may think that, okay, these creatures can use these rocks that are from the debris, to travel interplanetary, right? So there's already a theory about it, and it's called the panspermia theory. So many experiments have been done on tardigrades to see their extreme abilities, such as putting them in space in cryptobiotic state and so, and so on. But what hasn't been done so far is to turn them to cryptobiotic state, take them to space, and turn them alive in space. So if we can do that, we can say that Tardigrades are a reasonable candidate for a journey that might take more than 10 years. A non-rocket powered journey with this debris that might take more than 10 years can carry also tardigrades for such an assumption. So that is where we come in. We want to do the missing experiment that is not done on tardigrades. We want to turn tardigrades alive while they're in space. To do such an extraordinary experiment, we definitely need a spacecraft. A spacecraft that can keep water in a liquid state, so then when we need to rehydrate the tardigrades, we can just pour the water and so on. Also, we need to observe their behavior, see if they're alive and they are thriving and so on. So, an easy way to do that is to establish a video link. But remember, we are using a nanosatellite. Since we are using a nanosatellite, we don't have so much space to put a lot of solar panels. And therefore, we don't have enough energy because solar panels are the energy source for us. So establishing a video link requires a lot of video. Like I cannot just run Skype and enjoy, oh, how are you, tardigrade? So <laughs> that's not going to work. So therefore, we decided to put an onboard computer, similar to what you have on your cell phones, to do this processing there. Count the number of them and like a good way to analyze their behavior is to see whether they go toward a food source. So we came up with this algorithm, and actually it works very nice in the lab and so on. But we needed to assure the robustness of this algorithm so this algorithm will not mix up other organisms with tardigrades. Wait a second, other organisms? Why do we need other organisms? Well. Since we are turning tardigrades alive in space, we have to provide them food, water, of course they're floating in water, and oxygen. It's like sending an astronaut to space. You have to provide all the life support thing. And uh, luckily, we don't need to make a specialized toilet for them. Hopefully you know about that one. So since we are following up the same study that uh, ESA did, we are working on a species of tardigrades called the Milnesium tardigradum. And hopefully, uh, my tardigrade friends will uh, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing their name correctly. <laughs> I'm an engineer, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, it turns out that Milnesium tardigradum lives in an ecosystem. So, we want to make on our satellite a biome, a microecosystem, with rotifers, which are the food source for tardigrades. And rotifers, they also eat bacteria as their food source. Bacteria, rotifers, both were in space, and they were like, okay, space works for us. And then we need also the oxygen producer and lichens, 
were also another space survivor, which they, they're great for our experience, so we can put all these guys together and see what will happen in space. All these guys were in space, but no one tried to put them in a unique ecosystem as a unique experiment to see what's going to happen. So, going back to the question that I asked, how can I distinguish tardigrades from other organisms? Because like, I, I'm going to use, say, like, an algorithm, and I'm looking for some dots in the end, and I have to have the like, tardigrades different from any other things. So, we decided to genetically modify tardigrades and add to them the green fluorescent protein, also known as GFP. So, GFP will make tardigrades glow in the presence of UV light, as you see, these, these mice are glowing. So, as you can see, our experiment requires a lot of disciplines, such as biology, genetic engineering, all the way down to computer, mechanical, electrical engineering. And you see disciplines such as education, business management, fine art, all these are like uh, a big, vital part of our mission. So, tardigrade is one of the experiments that we are doing on our satellite. We are working on a miniaturized spectrometer that we're trying to fit it in a satellite so we can do solar spectroscopy. So by that, we can see basically the interaction between the output of the sun and the atmosphere. That will help us for later on, we can study greenhouse effects and further science and studies about the atmosphere. And as if this was not enough, we're also trying to study the effect of no gravity on humans and specifically the bone decalcification. To do this experiment, we need, we need to put a sample of human bone and on a satellite alive, keep temperature, pH, everything, alive oxygen, and while we are observing its condition. So, you see, these are big dreams and ambitions with really a small budget. And we really like to enable everyone to appreciate our universe and make space accessible to everyone, using tiny animal to answer big questions. Hopefully, today I showed you big science using small tools. 